YouTube so everyone knows. All right, welcome everyone to today's seminar. I hope everyone had an okay break and a wonderful Easter. Uh, today, I'm happy to have Doa Ozturk and Zhu Ling Shi here to discuss their focus groups at the GEM workshop, which will be going on uh, this summer and as well at the mini GEM at AGU. So our first speaker is going to be Dr. Zhu Ling Shi today, and she will be discussing understanding the causes of geomagnetic disturbances in geospace. Dr. Shi is currently a research scientist at Virginia Tech and also a scientific visitor at the High Altitude Observatory and National Center for Atmospheric Research. Dr. Shi received her PhD in 2019 and has continued to work as a postdoctoral associate in the Superdon Research Group at Virginia Tech. Before receiving her PhD, she received her master's in space physics from the University Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2014 and her bachelor's degree from Wuhan University in 2011. She is currently leading the GEM focus group, understanding the causes of geomagnetic disturbances in geospace for hazard analysis of geomagnetically induced currents. And her research focus has been on um, ultra low frequency waves and their impact in space weather. Uh, with that, Zhu Ling, if you would like to take it away. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, I will just start by sharing my screen. Can you see my screen and hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, oops. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, thank you for a nice introduction. And uh, uh, yeah, as Kai just introduced, uh, I'm Xuan Ningxi from Virginia Tech. Uh, I'd like to first uh, thank all my uh, co-chairs here, like Doa, uh, Mark, Zhonghua, and Josh, uh, for their support and contribution to this talk, uh, which focus on an overview of of our GEM focus group, and we just started the last year in 2023. Oh, sorry, 2022. Okay, yeah, so I'd like to uh, start with like why we proposed uh, such a, a geomagnetic disturbance or a GMD focus group. So uh, as we know, like the interaction between the sun and the Earth's magnetosphere, which I use this uh, little gem uh, logo to represent the Earth's magnetosphere, and they generate various phenomena in the near Earth uh, space, including the magnetospheric and atmospheric current, uh, which can uh, uh, generate geomagnetic disturbances we call uh, GMDs. So all uh, this GMD uh, in turn can interact with uh, the the Earth or the ground and, uh, and, and generate uh, induced geoelectric field in the Earth. So this geoelectric field, uh, again, they uh, in turn generate geomagnetic uh, induced current or we call GICs. And those induced currents, they can damage uh, technological infrastructures such as uh, power grids and uh, uh, pipelines and submarine cables. So, that is why uh, it is uh, crucial to understand the causes of GMDs if we would like to uh, better uh, predict GICs. So, so this uh, cartoon on the right hand side shows that this is really a uh, um, multiple discipline uh, community effort all the way from the sun to the mud and from space physics to geology as well as engineering if we want to have a better understanding of this topic. So it's a challenging one. And uh, so uh, the main purpose of this focus group is to uh, improve our physical understanding of the causes of GMDs and through observation, mod uh, modeling, and uh, theories. So this schematic here shows uh, a year, uh, year by year breakdown of the expected activities uh, throughout the course of this focus group and the science question we're trying to address as well as specific uh, goals. So in the end, we like like to have an improved understanding of what causes uh, GMDs, and we hope to provide feedback to relevant uh, communities uh, such as uh, uh, the uh, ge uh, ge geophysicals as well as uh, space weather oper operational community on where the data are needed. And we hope to provide suggestions on the improvement can be made in various prediction models as well. So in the end, uh, not the least, definitely, we're also trying to bridge the gap between the GEM community and the other communities, such as the uh, 
uh, the uh, ge uh, geology as well as like the power system engineering community, as I mentioned, this is a really a uh, 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 interdisciplinary uh, uh, effort. So this kind of a gap between our specific this community and the other community is really a, a challenging for us to uh, to moving this uh, forward. So our focus group is particularly timely uh, because we have the recently up, uh, upgrading of many uh, ground-based ma magnetometers uh, across the world, as well as the upgraded uh, various models, including MHD models, kinetic and hybrid models. We also have very promising machine learning techniques uh, which can be used for GMD or GL2 field GIC predictions. And uh, the recently made available 3D uh, empirical transfer functions through the, the NSF supported a, a, school, a school program across the United States can be used for a more accurate geoelectric field estimation. So there's a, a strong and broad interest uh, in our GM community uh, for the GMD research. So many current and uh, past folks group have discussed uh, GMD uh, in their respective context through observation, uh, modeling, and the predictions they are listed here. Uh, and also in the last uh, Gen Fox School, which is the, the, our first year, we have in total five uh, sessions and uh, three of them are joint sessions with uh, multiple uh, various Fox groups. And we also scheduled, uh, even scheduled a, a field trip to the Honolulu Magnetic Observatory and caused, caused some man-made geomagnetic disturbance GMD event uh, in the real-time Honolulu Observatory uh, time series data shown here. So there are lots of uh, interesting activity going on. Looking forward to the upcoming 2023 GMSUM workshop in uh, San Diego, California this summer. So we will have three, uh, three sessions in total, one standalone and two joint sessions. So we hope to discuss about uh, the various GMD database already available through uh, quite a few recent uh, studies and uh, talk about their possible causes. And uh, uh, so for future activities in the next couple of years, we do want to have uh, interactive discussion sessions on the modeling challenges to some data model, model, model comparison, as well as some panel discussions by inviting people from on different communities like space science data analysis and uh, modeling magnetic terroric as well as the engineering community so that we can, can sit together to access the needs for the GSE prediction, as well as discuss uh, potential access to direct GSE measurement, which is uh, proven to be quite limited uh, right now for our community. So uh, in the next couple of slides, I'd like to highlight some recent uh, progress being made in the GMD research as well as the uh, geometric field and the GICs. So I will start uh, by the uh, GMD statistics. So uh, many studies uh, have, have investigated their occurrence, spatial distribution, their in hemispheric uh, conjugacies, as well as multiple uh, uh, dependence uh, factors, such as uh, geomagnetic activity and uh, solar wind, uh, even the solar cycle dependence have already been recently investigated. And uh, so uh, most of them use the data B or the so-called uh, the DBDT spikes uh, from, from various uh, ground magnetometer chains such as SuperMag or individual ground magnetometer chains. So uh, multiple studies have confirmed like the DBDT spikes occur in three local time hotspots, once in premium sector, while around the dome, and another, some, some of them come from another one in the premium sectors. So a recent study by Minan et al. 2023 uh, confirmed that the, the spike occurrence is uh, have a strong solar wind, uh, no, solar cycle dependence, and it's a maximum in the declining phase of the solar cycle, and particularly uh, obvious for solar cycle 23. This is the occurrence of those spikes that you can see from here. The significant high occurrence compared with the other solar cycle uh, intervals. So, uh, so the GMD uh, drivers has long been uh, thought to be the large scale magnetic or atmospheric currents, such as the aurora electrojet at high latitude, as well as the uh, equatorial electrojet at low latitude, and their variation or enhancement during storm time and the substorm intervals. 
Uh, but a more and a more uh, recent study have confirmed the importance of uh, smaller scale localized island ferry currents associated with very uh, aurora uh, activities such as streamers, omega band, and uh, PBIs, etc. And also the geomagnetic uh, pulsations, or we call ultra low frequency waves, and uh, uh, also another driver of GMD and uh, geoelectric field, as well as the GICs. So uh, on the right hand side is a recent study from Hans at all 2021. You can see various uh, pulsations being observed uh, during various phases of the uh, 2003 Halloween storms. And those pulsations being observed in ground magnetometer data, which is blue line here, they are actually coupled to actual GIC measurement, which is a red line, line here. So uh, although the main a uh, goal of this focus group is uh, for the GMD uh, research uh, uh, trying to characterize the uh, drivers, uh, but we really need to think beyond the GMDs. So, so uh, one takeaway message here is that like uh, the largest GMD or DBDT does not necessarily correspond to the largest geometric field or GICs. It depends on multiple factors. So the first step is from the GMD to geoelectric field. What we need to take into account is the geology. That is the Earth's conductivity structure. So the geoelectric field can be calculated through the geomagnetic field data and the various Earth's conductivity models. So I'm not an expert here. I strongly recommend you to read this uh, review paper by Cab uh, Cabra 2020, uh, mentioned about the various uh, global original Earth conductivity model and the various ways of estimating the geoelectric field uh, from magnetic field data and the Earth conductivity structures. So the main takeaway message here, uh, whenever like the 3D Earth conductivity uh, uh, model available, we should use that because it takes into account both of the depths, the 1D depths dependent Earth conductivity structure, as well as the, uh, the, the lateral variation of Earth conductivity. And uh, this can be achieved through magnetic terrific surveys and uh, can, can be used for uh, a more accurate estimation of geoelectric fields. And uh, so the second step uh, is from the geoelectric field to, to GICs. This is a so-called engineering steps uh, uh, because it needs information on the network and network configuration, uh, such as the orientation, the names, and the electric, uh, electrical re resistance of the conductor, such as the transmission lines, and the method of the station or substation groundings. So one example from the Lucas at all 2020, uh, it demonstrated how you can use uh, magnetic field data from a magnetic observatory, which are yellow stars here, and the uh, the three D uh, uh, electromagnetic transfer function from magnetic uh, magnetic magnetic telluric uh, survey site, which are blue dots here, to calculate the geoelectric field, and then take into account of the geometry of the transmission lines, then to calculate the induced uh, voltage and current in the uh, transmission lines. But in the case of a different infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the model can be totally different. So one example from the uh, railway uh, from UK is shown on the right-hand side, and uh, so, or to make uh, this even more complicated, if you are interested in some uh, submarine cable, communication cable uh, on the sea floor, then you need to take into account of like the seawater above the cables, like the seawater conductivity, the depths and uh, the length of the ocean, as well as the coastal line. And, uh, and also you need to take into account of what's below, which is uh, the, below the, the, the sea floor, which is the Earth's conductivity. So if you're interested in the modeling the, uh, the submarine cable geomagnetic inductions, uh, please re refer to this uh, recent paper by Chuck Body et al. Uh, 2022, and the reference is there uh, for more information. So uh, in the end, I just want to uh, to echo back with what I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. So this is a very important and uh, interesting topic, which involved interdisciplinary collaborations. We need uh, people from um, the space uh, space space physicists like you and me in the GEM community, and also we need geolo uh, geologists as well as engineer 
uh, in, in order to like modeling or predicting or forecast uh, the GICs in the future. So yeah, so which is the main purpose of our focus group. So I will give the floor now to Doa to talk about the education and the outreach component of the GMD research. So feel free to take away Doa, or you want me to advance the slides for you, or share your own screen, whichever way you prefer. Thank you, Shiling. I think it would be great if you can share your screen. Mm -hmm, sure. Um, mm -hmm. So we also want to highlight that studying these geomagnetic disturbances could be a great tool for education and outreach. And um, for this specifically, we have a program called Space Weather Underground, in short SWAT. And this was initiated by Chuck Smith at the University of New Hampshire. And in 2020, Winju Connor adopted this uh, concept to University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, and then as, when she moved to Goddard Space Flight Center, she started another SWAC initiative in Maryland. Um, so of course, there are similar programs across the globe trying to use geomagnetic disturbances for education um, but uh, what we have been doing is using the simple aurora monitor developed by Vitrine, uh, who is also in uh, attendance today. Um, these are 3D flux gate magnetometers, and they are very really cost effective and mobile. So what we do is we bring in high school students into our laboratories at the universities and teach them how to build these magnetometers. This equips them with um, uh, technical skills that they can use in their um, careers later and also helps them develop a STEM identity. Um, we specifically offer three different programs at University of Alaska. One of them is a paid internship program for undergraduate students. Uh, we had three students participate through this um, internship program so far. Uh, the other one is this high school student project I just mentioned. Uh, we conduct this as a summer internship opportunity. And lastly, we offer a program called Educator Development Program. So you can see it on the bottom uh, from July 2022 too. Uh, in this one, we recruit students across uh, uh, educators, high school teachers across rural Alaska. And we bring them in uh, to the University of Alaska uh, for, two, uh, for a week uh, with generous support from Alaska Space Grant. And we have classes that they learn about space weather, uh, data processing, coding a little bit, and and they also uh, assemble their own magnetometers, conduct experiments with it, and learn about ways how they can incorporate GMD measurements uh, pertaining to space weather concepts and aurora, and how they can incorporate this into their uh, curriculums. Um, you can see from this map uh, on the top that partnering with uh, high schools is especially beneficial in places like Alaska because we have significant problems when it comes to infrastructure. Um, being the uh, power and Wi-Fi uh, or internet connections of, of some sorts. Uh, so in the blue stars, you can see the location of high schools and in um, pink crosses are uh, the magnetometers that are no longer operational and green crosses are operational science grade magnetometers. So the uh, west of Alaska is uh, virtually not covered for GMD measurements. So by partnering with schools, uh, what we can do is increase GMD measurements from these regions while raising the space weather awareness across uh, the state. Um, and you can see in the bottom plot a comparison of how well these magnetometers developed by WIPRIVS are doing. Uh, the, in the orange line uh, that you see is our uh, science grade uh, magnetometer from Geophysical Institute located at Poker Flat. And in blue, we have our uh, SWAG magnetometer. And you can see that it captures the variability very well. Um, can we go to the next slide, Shuli? Uh, there's also uh, various opportunities using GMB for outreach, uh, GMB research for outreach. This is a project we conduct with Stan Odenwald, who is a member of NASA Heliophysics Education Activation Team, NASA HEAT in short. Um, and Stan has been working on using smartphone magnetometers to detect geomagnetic storms. Um, and he has published this uh, very extensive uh, uh, article uh, in Space Weather Journal where he compared different phone magnetometers and their performances. Um, so what we do is with my students, we um, look at um, dates where we have uh, high KP forecasts uh, from our Geophysical Institute website. And we conduct campaign events where we leave our phones in record mode overnight. And you can see again a comparison. In purple, we have the science grade magnetometer. In green, our detrended, uh, basically iPhone magnetometer that I used for this experiment. And you can see it traces the variability very well 
um, they are separated in space, so we expected some differences uh, and a shift in the waveform. But again, the dominant uh, frequencies are very well captured, especially the lower frequencies. So that's why uh, this could be um, easily adapted across different uh, approaches and use um, help um, us in our education and outreach endeavors. And next slide, Shuling, I will leave it to you again. Uh, feel free to take over, Doa. Yeah, is this um, an announcement of the GSE workshop? Yes. Yeah, I think this is uh, the workshop uh, where uh, be on uh, College Park, Maryland, and uh, in October. So yeah, feel free to uh, yeah. I think it's still at the very beginning, right? Trying to look for the ideas, suggestions, uh, to uh, eliminating and uh, fruitful workshops. And uh, yeah, here's the information of the uh, I think probably the convenience uh, convenience of this workshop. And uh, yeah, I think more information will be probably released soon about how to participate or to contribute. This is, uh, I think, an outcome of uh, the last year's GSE Innovation Lab and uh, trying to build a more sustainable community for GSE research, as I uh, mentioned at the very begin beginning of this talk, since it involves the multiple dis uh, disciplines from uh, the specific physics, uh, geology, as well as the uh, uh, engineer engineering or industry companies. So it, it would be great if we have such kind of small kind of conference, which you can bring uh, different people together to sit together to work on this topic. So yeah, anything else you'd like to add on Doa? No, thank you, Shuling. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's all for the GSE uh, folks group. So we look forward to seeing you all at the gym. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shuling. And Doa for a wonderful overview of the focus group. <clears throat> um, I have a quick question uh, that you might be able to answer, Juling, but it's with regard to someone else's work, so I understand if you don't know the details. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In the Milan study, did they give any reason why they observed larger dB by dTs during the declining phase? Um, I thought generally they were associated with CMEs, and during that phase we would kind of see a drop off in CMEs. Yeah, I f yeah, uh, yeah. To be honest, I forgot about all the details. <laughs> Just reviewed those papers in the uh, last couple of weeks. Yeah, so it may have something to do with the high slowing speed. Mm -hmm. I yeah, yeah, during the declining phase. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You can check out this paper. Sorry, I forgot about the details no, about why. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. is it is it Steve Milan? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Maybe, I'll, I'll, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, that's, I'll follow up with you to get a... Uh, yeah. yeah, by the way, yeah, I have all the references here, like for, oh, okay. for the paper I mentioned. So uh, I already, yeah, it's Steve Miller. Yeah. yeah. Already, uh, yeah, you. share the slides with you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And Doa, with regard to the outreach staff, uh, George Cuck has uh, suggested uh, that you guys might want to reach out to the American Association of Physics Teachers, if you guys haven't yet. Thank you. That's a that's a great suggestion. We stay very local to Alaska and use our own uh, education outreach office for uh, accessing to teachers. But yeah, for larger um, collaborations with the New Hampshire and Maryland, that would be a great option. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, so Doa, if you would like to take the screen, and I will start with your intro. Um, so Doa received her PhD in space physics, as well as a conjugate PhD in scientific computing and a degree in diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership from the University of Michigan in 2018. Her PhD focused on understanding solar wind dynamics and the control of solar wind dynamic pressure in the coupled magnetosphere and atmosphere thermosphere system. Upon graduating, Doa joined the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a postdoctoral scholar in the Ionospheric Atmospheric Remote Sensing Group. There she developed the high latitude input for mesoscale electrodynamics framework, a code library that enables incorporating measurements of electric fields as boundary conditions to general circulation models. In 2020, she joined the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and has been working as a research assistant professor since 2021. 
Doa's research interests are in magnetosphere, atmosphere, thermosphere coupling, interhemispheric symmetries, mesoscale variability of the near Earth environment, application of machine learning to heliophysics data, as well as citizen science and education and public outreach. Uh, with that, Doa, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see my screen and hear me fine. Yep. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Kyle, for the introduction and having us over to talk about these NSF focus groups. Um, I'll be introducing the magnetospheric sources of particle precipitation and their role on electrodynamic coupling of magnetosphere, ionosphere, and thermosphere focus group. In short, we call this focus group MPEC, Magnetospheric Precipitation on Electrodynamic Coupling. And before I begin, I also like to introduce my co-chairs and thank them, especially Dong Lin. Um, our other co-chairs are Eugene Yu, Steve Kepler, and Catherine Garcia Sage. Uh, so before um, I talk about our focus group, I wanted to give you a brief time history of events, a uh, bad pun, uh, but um, what led to this focus group basically. So it all started back in 2019 when uh, I was helping the 3D ionospheric electrodynamic coupling of the magnetosphere ionosphere thermosphere focus group uh, led by Huinju Kanner, in short, 3D IEMIT uh, focus group. So we had a joint session with the metals metrics and validation focus group, <laughs> which is a resource focus group for GEM. And we conducted this joint session on a special topic on ionospheric conductance. Um, this was just before the pandemic, and um, I recently discovered this tool called Mantimeter, and I wanted to see if we can um, survey our participants in real time uh, about what challenges they face in understanding ionospheric conductance. Uh, so you can see um, this was a bird cloud conducted in real time by participant entries, and some very different issues started to arise when we started to talk about ionospheric conductance. The larger the word is, the uh, most common the problem is, and you can see it not being a well-posed question, uh, not having defined, uh, very well-defined observational needs, having data uncertainties and vertical uh, structuring were some of the problems people um, commonly voiced in this um, survey. Uh, also, you can see that uh, some of these other um, issues arising, like neutral densities, missing chemistry, uh, usage of incoherent scattering radar measurements, which, dis which distinctly point to the coupling of magnetosphere, ionosphere, and thermosphere domains. So the other issues that arise, in, like particle precipitation, aurora, and full sampling in space and time, were exactly right for a, a potential GEM focus group or something that we can address as a gem, as the GEM community. Um, so that is why um, we made note of these type of. Um, um, topics that arise during the sampling of uh, what people thought were the problems uh, faced by the community. So in 20, then in 2021, uh, during the virtual GEM workshop, uh, we've conducted another survey to determine the legacy of the uh, 3D IEMIT focus group, which was uh, ending. So this focus group fo um, had the more uh, emphasis on the uh, electrodynamic coupling and as it was ending, we wanted to understand what new understanding was necessary uh, going forward in the electrodynamic coupling. So here, uh, what aspects of coupling was missing or deemed as uh, possible next steps for the community uh, was the main goal. And um, it also gives us an understanding of what IEMIT was able to accomplish. And again, uh, even the old audiences uh, were different. Some uh, of the topics that arise were very similar. One of them is that MIT coupling across different scales, uh, that it was uh, an essentially multi-scale coupling phenomena. And the other one is the particle precipitation and uh, the issues that we have with particle, particle precipitation to determine ionospheric conductance were uh, deemed as important. And here, I would say, um, what other surveys showed us about neutral densities, vertical structuring, chemistry kind of disappeared for this uh, uh, in the survey when we were looking from a GEM workshop point of view. So, uh, okay, I managed to proceed. Uh, lastly, we wanted to see what tools and methods were most important to researchers studying ionospheric conductance and what they needed most. And during the 2019 survey at MiniGEM, um, 
uncertainty it was ranked as the most essential priority. So quantifying and propagating uncertainties in conductivity models and data uh, seems to be very important for researchers, followed by these two other uh, entries. One of them is the physics-based uh, local global uh, models and their development, uh, and the coordinated campaign efforts to understand ionospheric conductance. So after this uh, 3D IEMIT uh, focus group was concluded, I tried to look at the statistics of the topics represented. So up to 2019, the precipitational conductance were not really well represented among the topics that were uh, discussed in the in this focus group. Uh, but around 2019, we started to see a increase in uh, presentations which had precipitational conductance mentioned. So the blue is the uh, I have a very sensitive mouse, sorry for that. Um, the blue uh, bars show us the total presentation. The pink ones are uh, only precipita uh, precipitation, and the green ones are the conductance uh, topic. And they could there could also be talks that have both of them when they overlap. So after two thousand uh, up to two thousand nineteen, you see the precipitation and conductance were not the majority, but starting from two thousand nineteen, uh, they gained prominence, and you can see. Um, that our understanding of the large-scale electrodynamic coupling pertaining to convection uh, up till this point was established with 3D IEMIT. But uh, following this, uh, you can see the significant drop with the pandemic as well um, as the total presentations. Um, precipitation and conductance started to constitute more than half of the talks uh, in our sessions. So here we started to understand that the next step, the organic next step to continue the legacy of an ionospheric electrodynamic or coupling of MIT focus group uh, need to uh, revolve uh, around the precipitation and conductance aspect. Um, that is why um, I went ahead and <laughs> Uh, start, um, went to uh, Donglin to recruit him in this endeavor, uh, who is a modeler like me, and we wanted to understand magnetospheric precipitation. And um, we gathered our team, uh, each new Steve Kepler and Katie Garcia Sage, who are very strong in different aspects of this research topic. And we started to work on this focus group, in short, we call MPEG. And the aim is to characterize magnetospheric particle precipitation uh, from source to destination with rejuvenating observational and numerical capabilities. And one of the things that stood out in all these surveys was the multi-scale aspect of the coupling. So we have precipitation from different regions that you can see from this uh, schematic in the, in the top. Uh, different wave particle interactions can cause different precipitation signatures, uh, different energies, uh, or different flux values. Um, it could be due to scattering into loss cone or dipolarization, energization due to different magnetospheric processes, like traveling convection vortices, or uh, even the Calvin Helmholtz inst uh, type instabilities can cause precipitation. So it's a very large domain. Uh, we also know that these different mechanisms have different precipitation signatures and characteristics on top of the ionosphere, and you can see some of them here, uh, depending whether it's a monoenergetic precipitation, broad precipitation, any type of um, scattering into, again, loss cone or uh, ion precipitation uh, could have different effects on the ionosphere thermosphere system because they have different distinct energies, different fluxes, and they are more effective in different um, magnetic latitude and magnetic local time components. And lastly, depending on where they are depositing their energies, the 3D ionosphere coupling with thermosphere system could also uh, be affected. And the resulting variability also ends up feeding back into the ionosphere thermosphere system in the forms of outflow uh, in the, and variability of the conductivity. So with that, uh, we wanted to focus on these three different uh, aspects to advance the physical knowledge and improve the numerical modeling of magnetospheric particle precipitation, effects of precipitation on ionospheric electrodynamics, and response of the IT system to this precipitation. And uh, we were luckily selected to um, be one of the focus groups starting in 2022. So as I went through all these different scopes, you probably noticed that we have a lot of synergy with the newly finalized uh, or ongoing focus groups. So here I denoted the active focus groups in green at the time. Uh, the uh, dark ones were the um, focus groups that just ended. Uh, the pink ones had a year to go and uh, the, uh, the color in between demonstrated it is about to end for the IEMIT. Uh, 
So uh, as I said, there's a lot of synergy, for example, with the magnetotail, uh, the dipolarization and, fo um, and its effect on inner magnetosphere focus group. Uh, they, uh, they've studied dipolarization fronts, flux bundles, plasma bubbles, all have different contributions to the overall particle acceleration. So these components can lead to the generation of different wave modes uh, that contribute to precipitation. Um, there's the magnetic reconnection focus group. And again, reconnection has a distinct uh, precipitation signature and where this reconnection sites map to is an important problem for us to uh, understand. Uh, there's the interhemispheric asymmetries focus group, which aims to understand how these asymmetries form and conductance is an important driver of such asymmetries. Again, we had a system understanding of radiation belt focus groups. Um, this is, a, generally provides a population for precipitation, impact of cold plasma uh, for, um, in the magnetospheric physics focus group, which also uh, focuses on outflow and outflow effects. So uh, that is why it's highly relevant. And there's the self-consistent inner magnetospheric modeling focus groups, which investigates wave particle interactions. And again, uh, how these particles are transported or lost, um, which is highly relevant for our magnetospheric precipitation focus group. Uh, we also had two new joining, uh, two uh, new focus groups that were selected with us, and this year we also had the uh, comparative planetary magnetic processes focus group selected. Um, Bea uh, has uh, presented about the MESO focus group uh, two weeks ago, and uh, Shuling just presented about the GIC and GMD focus groups. And again, there is a lot of synergy going on because the mesoscale phenomena gain a lot of importance for um, MIT uh, coupling and modeling in the recent years. And the GIC focus group uh, magnetic field signatures of precipitation on the ground is very important because whether these disturbances are caused by strong precipitation or the transport of mesoscale structures is a long-standing problem we want to uh, understand. And again, uh, the selection of this comparative planetary magnetosphere processes focus group had been really interesting for us because uh, it provides a very fundamental understanding of the physical aspects behind precipitation. For example, if we talk about Mars, we're looking at the system uh, very driven by the solar wind and interplanetary magnetic field. Solar energetic particles play a significant role in the Mars's magnetosphere. Or, but when we look at a, a magnetosphere like Jupiter, we know internal processes are very important and uh, we can't really talk about some of the aspects we do at Earth or other planets like Mars. So we are hoping that there is significant synergy to explore there as well. So to further explore these, we have carefully tried to be carefully plan our focus group activities in our joint session. In June 2022, uh, we had two standalone sessions, one specifically focused on modeling and the other one was on observations. And we held two joint sessions with the IEMIT and the um, South Consistent Model Inner Magnetosphere Modeling Focus Groups. Uh, we had more than 27 presenters across these uh, four um, sessions that we hold. And in September 2022, we organized and submitted two decadal survey papers. And I want to especially thank all my co-authors who helped uh, write these two papers that we have submitted. And in December 2022, we had the mini jam workshop uh, where we had one standalone session and the opening talk was on iron precipitation at Mercury as a scene setting talk, which I believe was really interesting. Um, so with these, we are really trying to aim to understand the magnetospheric processes associated with varied types of oral particle precipitation, their characteristics, and how these precipitating energetic ions and electrons uh, associated with different oral forms uh, affect the ionospheric conductance and conductivity, and how these affect the uh, global magnetosphere ionosphere thermosphere system. So, I want to focus on briefly some of the research directions that we have with this focus group. Uh, one of them uh, is the understanding diffuse aurora. So especially while getting ready for our decadal survey submissions, the first thing we wanted to focus on was this phenomena because it constitutes more than 60% of the uh, energy that goes into auroral oval. Uh, but there are several components that can affect uh, electron precipitation. And that's why accurate quantification of various factors like plasma sheet source distributions, electron drift, electron pitch angle scattering, back scattering of electrons uh, that could affect diffuse precipitation needs to be better understood. And you can see in this diagram where different type of magnetospheric waves are active. So understanding how they affect diffuse electron precipitation better is an 
uh, has been an ongoing research in our field. And um, in addition, we want to also better understand the day side diffuse aurora. Uh, there are competing processes and where they are more dominant, uh, but further studies are needed to understand day side diffuse aurora better. Um, again, another phenomenon that we want to better understand is ion precipitation uh, and better quantifying uh, what processes contribute to the ion precipitation. Uh, we have pulsating aurora, which has gained significant prominence in the last few years. And um, one really important thing about pulsating aurora is it can introduce populations about uh, very high energy, which have MEV, uh, ener uh, uh, average energies in the MEV range. But uh, most of our models are using uh, the MSP measurement-based empirical specifications for uh, diffuse aurora which doesn't account for pulsating aurora because they only go up to 30 keV. And um, again, we do not account for uh, diffuse aurora or diffuse precipitation as a result of relativistic electron precipitation, which can be highly effective for uh, total ionospheric conductance because they can penetrate deeper into the atmosphere and how they affect uh, other processes in the um, mesosphere, like the ozone depletion is also not well understood. Our second uh, the continuation of this research direction one is understanding discrete aurora and under specifically understanding monoenergetic and broadband precipitation. Here you can see a study uh, conducted by Kristin Gabriel, and they are converting all uh, Temis white light all sky imager data into energy flux and energy. And this kind of lays out what uncertainties there could be to get a global sense of monoenergetic precipitation. So further understanding these different structures, what is the associated energy fluxes, what are the associated energies are necessary uh, in a global scale for us to be using these uh, products for numerical modeling of uh, precipitation. Uh, as in terms of broadband precipitation, details of uh, how different wave limits and electron energization and transfer of this energy to kinetic scales is an ongoing research area, which we need to be better understanding for uh, being able to model broadband precipitation and understanding different auroral forms, how they occur and evolve based on geomagnetic activity uh, is also an expanding topic. Um, our second research direction is understanding uh, under, uh, this effects of magnetic particle precipitation on ionospheric conductance and conductivity. So in the first research direction, we talked about what are the origins of this precipitation. Now we want to understand how they affect ionospheric conductance and conductivity, especially looking at the diffuse, discrete, and field line current descriptors. And here is a study by Lokka and Jenk, and it shows how uh, basically large scale versus meso and small scale uh, driven systems differ from each other. So if you look at this, um, sort of um, dark shaded yellow versus these brighter yellow, it shows that different altitudes are affected differently from this type of driving, whether it's a large scale driving or whether it's a uh, alphabetic or a higher, um, higher resolution driving. And here is another study by Robinson et al. It shows hemispherically integrated um, par uh, particle energy fluxes and dual heating from uh, field line currents that uh, are obtained from Ampere. And you can see that it can capture now a lot of structures or a lot of variability in the temporal scale for polar cap potentials, uh, electron flux, and um, indices like auror electrojet. So this uh, here, you can see the comparison between red and blue is between the model, which is black, and the actual data. And we are now able to capture some of these temporal variability that was missing previously. So taking better advantage of large scale global field line current maps, and especially with the higher resolution provided by Iridium Next satellites would be uh, very important going for forward. And our last research direction is understanding how this conductance and conductivity affects the global coupled system back. Um, we have focused on three different regions like the D region conductivity, determining the role of the region conductivity on meso and large scale processes, like some of the oral forms that we have seen, uh, e-region conductivity, understanding missing in-situ links at different altitudes, 
F region conductivity to resolve the electron precipitation and its relation to upflow and outflow, and how this ionosphere thermosphere system that is modulated by the changes in conductance and conductivity could map back to magnetosphere are uh, very important. Here you can see a study, again, conducted by Moore, Hock, and Carsey Sage, and they are using an LFM model with and without O plus outflow, and you can see the change in the overall magnetic field. Um, the magnetosphere is more elongated and more expanded when O plus outflow is included. So it is important for um, us to understand this IT feedback to the magnetosphere. So based on these research directions we have identified for our focus group, we have planned our June 2022 workshop where we will again have two standalone sessions on observation and modeling. We will have one joint session with the GIC focus group led by Xu Ling Shi and uh, intermissary asymmetries group led by Hyo Min Kim. We will have another joint uh, session on self-consistent inner magnetospheric modeling and uh, led by Christian Ferrades and machine learning led by Matt Argal. Uh, another joint session on the meso and deep focus groups led by Bea and Chris, uh, Bea Gallard de la Corte and um, Christine Gabriels, um, and then one joint session with comparative planetary magnetic processes led by George Clark. So as a result of all this, we want to provide a challenge event database for validation, uh, for data model comparisons, and discussion of possible causes of uncertainty for the community. And we hope to get a unified and parameterized characterization of different magnetospheric sources of particle precipitation through average energy and energy flux as uh, deliverable. Uh, for the community in the, at the end of this focus group. Uh, with that, uh, we, uh, want, I want to make two announcements. One of them is on a frontier special issue on particle precipitation in the Earth and other planetary systems, their sources and impacts, which is highly relevant to this focus group. This is led by um, one of our co-chairs, Yichun Yu, and the manuscript submission deadline is 4th of July, 2023. And the second announcement is about the Chapman Conference Phase Two proposal. This is an effort uh, led by NASA Space Precipitation Impacts Group, and um, Aaron Brenneman is leading this uh, Chapman Conference proposal on particle precipitation drivers' properties and impacts on atmosphere, ionosphere, and magnetosphere coupling, which is again highly relevant with our focus group. Uh, with that, I would like to extend a very precipitating and pulsating thank you to all. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing you at GEM 2023 in person or virtually. And if you want to keep in touch with us, here is a tiny URL link, which is uh, join MPEC now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doa, for a wonderful overview of your guys' work. Uh, so we have a couple questions. Uh, the first one comes from Jason Durr. Uh, he's wondering if there is more specific information on the relation between ionospheric conductance and specific mesoscale overall forms, uh, such as polar cap patches or streamers, uh, roll beads or SAPs, et cetera. I know you covered a little bit about it with regard to pulsating diffuse aurora, but is there anything else on some of the more discrete auroral types? Uh, yeah, there are very interesting research, and I think our joint focus group with MESO and VIP uh, will address uh, or showcase some of the research that's been conducted in there. Um, I would like to, um, there are, there's a really nice review article, and just because it was asked now, it completely eludes me. Um, I think Foresight, but yes, Colin Foresight's um, uh, article, he has a review article on mesoscale oral forms and their precipitation effects. Uh, so that would be a really interesting paper that covers some of these different aspects like the beads, uh, streamers, and uh, giant undulations. Yes, I recall that one. I believe Bea and Toshi are also authors on it, I think. Um, uh, so they, uh, Chris, some of Christine's work will cover a bit of discrete aurora, but none of the forms yeah, in general. Or sorry, separate out the forms. Um, we also have a follow-up question um, by George. I may need him to clarify it though. Um, or, uh, how do the results from your guys' analysis feed into, oh, the congressional budget? I think this is... I don't see that question. Uh, sorry, um, it was sent just to me uh, because I was chatting with him. Um, so do any of the space weather, 
do you guys do any work to try and get additional funding in a budget to help support some of these activities? Um, I mean, the idea behind submitting this as a focus group was to ensure that there is NSF uh, funding because uh, especially for NSF's GEM solicitation, a relevance to focus groups is deemed as a, a plus for proposals. So having a focus group at GEM uh, hopefully provides that opportunity for researchers. Yeah, all right, excellent, thank you. Uh, so thank you for again, uh, Doa and Zhu Ling for two wonderful talks. Uh, next week, we will be following up uh, Zhu Ling's talk uh, with two talks, uh, one from uh, Hannah Perry and a second from Alexander Fogg. They will both be discussing some of their recent work on GICs. And then in a few weeks, we will also have a follow up uh, with some of the research highlights that Doa has talked about uh, coming uh, from Maxine Grandin, Grandin and uh, Jonah. Uh, those talks will be in the next couple of weeks and we we'll hope to see everyone next week and throughout uh, the spring and summer. So thank you again, Jolene, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you again, Juning and Doa for two wonderful talks. Thank you. Thank you.